their ideas. The right spot. She writes the perfect speech and of course the photograph with the proposal. Okay, good evening. Good evening, sir. Okay, so. Hopefully everyone can hear me. How many are here today? I can't be excited. Yes, sir, we can hear. Only 12 participants. Uh, hopefully everyone else will be also joining. Okay, so <clears throat> I think you can uh, remember what we discussed on the last lecture or last class. Uh, uh, we discussed about the usual practices and uh, what are the safety rules and what are the uh, pros and uh, these things and general uh, regulations related to the workshop in automobile technology, especially related to the workshop workshops that we have inside the university. So as I promised you last uh, Tuesday, today we are going to discuss about the equipments and tools. So uh, uh, before I discuss about this one, I asked you to pro uh, like submit a small tutorial, right? So I saw I actually went through most of the tutorials. I couldn't go through every one of them. Uh, I went through most of them and I gathered some information about what you, what, uh, what is your idea, how much of idea you are actually having about these tools and uh, equipment. So <clears throat> uh, that being said, uh, today we're going to talk about the um, tools, but here we are going to general, we are going to discuss generally. So generally what are the tools and equipment that we can actually accommodate or we can utilize in uh, automobile uh, workshops and uh, what sort of a tools we need actually. So this um, section is not only related to this automobile engines and components module, this is also related to your automobile workshop practices module, right? So this is uh, more like a combining both of them and covering at one sort of a practice. So I'm seeing still guys are coming in and girls so still 15 hopefully everyone else will be joining uh if 
one could not join but still you have the video so as uh, i did last time the videos will be uploaded to youtube because um, last uh, batch or your senior batch was actually requested to upload it to you. it is possible to upload it to youtube because i think uh, the data fees are lower if you are using uh, youtube so my so i will still do i still continue doing the same thing but if you want can just let me know i can still upload it to um, moodle as well but um, my also be like uh, using more. youtube is actually easier because it's really mainly uh, designed or developed as a uh, online video platform anyway uh, okay so tools and equipment so I got a really good idea. What is uh, what your idea about equipments and workshops and tools, that sort of thing? So basically, you gave me some uh, details about equipment, but I don't see any like a proper or very good idea how the tools are divided, what sort of tools have to be used. So I don't see it in, in uh, most of your um, answers you have provided. So. Hopefully, with uh, once you finish this one, uh, we will be uh, you will be able to actually clarify this one. So, uh, before we go into discuss about the equipment and tools, first we need to have an idea what sort of workshops are available, right? So, when we goes to the workshop here, what we, I'm talking here at this instant, I'm only talking about the maintenance and tuning uh, or repairing workshop, not the manufacturing part. Manufacturing is a completely different section that which we will be discussing at the end of this uh, presentation. So by once we come to these automobile workshops, so we have different types of automobile workshops. As mentioned in the slide, uh, there are vehicle service centers, automobile maintenance and repair centers, and uh, specialized machine shop performance shops, right? So the difference between these two, uh, these, uh, Uh, these actually uh, quite uh, simple. So basically, if you go to the first three, so vehicle service centers and automobile repair workshops and vehicle maintenance shops, these are actually uh, dealing with the stock vehicle. Stock vehicles mean the vehicle that comes directly out from a, uh, a dealer or a manufacturer. So there are no, nothing is done to the engine, no modifications, nothing is done to these engines. But if you go to the latter two, that means specialized machine shops and performance shops, these are mainly working with performance engines and performance vehicles. So they you work with these specialized vehicles, uh, which they modify and get more power and to deliver some or to do a certain special works, that sort of thing. So uh, once you go to the vehicle service center, vehicle service center is what you usually know that uh, the cleaning, that sort of thing, and automobile maintenance and repairs, maintenance and repair centers usually do these uh, running repairs as well as accident repair. But uh, machine shops, so specialized machine shops means uh, 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 dedicated shops that actually uh, rebuild and refurbish and uh, upgrade the components of. Uh, engine for example engine rebuilders those are actually comes those are actually called as machine shops and the performance shops are uh, shops that actually upgrades the engine performance by either uh, rebuilding engine or adding more components or uh, changing some or uh, changing the electronics or software or something that sort of things were done by performance shops for example uh, uh, one popular performance shop in Sri Lanka is uh, platinum auto spa right platinum auto spa is one of the very popular uh, performance shop in sri lanka by um, another one rocket performance uh, there are so many uh, replicas we those are actually doing that sort of things specialized machine shops uh, for example if we go to uh, unit repairing in demo or Edrisinger brothers those are actually machine shops they only do the machining and rebuilding the engines so uh, they can either do it for the original stock or original specifications or if we provide some specification, they can do it up to that specification. So that's why these machine shops are actually working with the performance shop. 
so automobile maintenance and repair shops and vehicle service centers they are mainly working uh, they are ma mainly concerned about only concerned about the uh, stock vehicles that uh, are directly came out from the manufacturers right so knowing about this is very important in order to identify what sort of equipment should uh, need to actually use in each and every uh, workshop so different workshops actually have different equipment and tools so we'll move into the next slide and we'll see what other equipment and tools need so first thing you need to understand is uh, what is a tool and what is equipment so tool is actually a one general item that uh, made to perform a specific goal by the uh, at the same time equipment is a set of tools that uh, used to or set of tools that uh, work together to achieve a specific objective for example uh, uh, so this is actually a very broad example it's very uh, not that easy to it's not that easy to like explain but for example a uh, wrench is actually a tool right but uh, wake a lift it's not a tool, it's an equipment. It has so many components, so many tools inside it that works together in order to perform the lifting objective of the that particular machine, right? So basically the equipments usually are machines and the tools are sort of like a one or single component item. So, and the other thing is tools are actually mostly multi-purpose. They can use for multiple roles. For example, range can be, used for uh, tightening, redoing, all sort of equipment, but uh, the equipment for a specific task for, uh, for example, vehicle lift can only lift the vehicle and bring it back. It can't do anything else, right? But uh, tools uh, you can use for multiple purposes. That's the main uh, difference between these two. It's a good thing to know because uh, we call, talk about equipment and um, tools. And the other importance of this module is, or this section of this module is, so uh, as a part of your job uh, later, right? That means in future, as part of your job, you should be, uh, you will be able, you will be tasked with purchasing components or purchasing equipments and tools. So in order to do that, you have to have a very good idea what are the tools, what are the equipment, what sort of tools is needed for what application and the names of them, what are the specifications of them. So those things you need to know. So as, it doesn't matter how much uh, you can work with the tools, if you don't know how to specify them, how the specifications are coming up, what are the names of them, there's no way you can actually work with these, um, work in a uh, industry application, in industry situation, right? So uh, that's why this section is actually there. Okay, so we'll move into the next. Now, since we have a pretty good idea what are the equipment and uh, tools, we'll move to the next uh, slide. So, as I told you earlier, so different uh, equipment, these different shops. So, in here, when I uh, say shop, that means a workshop, right? I'm not going to say a workshop all the time. So different shops need different equipment based on their purpose and their purpose they serve. That's a very important thing. For example, in this image, you can see uh, there's a oil drainer. So the one, so this guy here is actually draining the oil, right? But here there's one guy working with the uh, inside the engine bay, probably removing something or adding something. So this is, seems to be a mechanic workshop. But if it is a paint shop, then these two guys are not necessary because uh, the paint shops do not actually change the oil. So based on their purpose, what the purpose they were performing, you have to have a have you have to decide the equipment necessary. Okay, so that's what important here. So that's why you need to know about the equipment and tools. Okay, so we'll start with the lift. So this is one of the main components or main 
equipment that needed or very much needed equipment in a, any workshop it could be a tire shop it could be a, a mechanic shop it could be a uh, what else a service center any of these things actually need this leaf but you can see over there in this uh, image there are like four types of leaves shown here but this is not the, the only four types of leaves are here there are so many types of leaf that i can't actually even uh, even list here to take one or two hours just to discuss about the leaf but here what i'm showing is four main types of leaf so the first one shown is a two post leaf which i am pretty sure you have most of you have seen and the second one is a scissor leaf right it's actually actuated similar to a scissor so that's why it called as a uh, scissor leaf and the uh, bottom row first one is the blue color one the multi purpose runaway lifts which are mostly used in the, which are mostly used in tire shops and the uh, fourth one is a mobile lift unit so these four actually uh, uh, these four lifts even though they are all four of them are doing the same thing the applications are quite different for example two post lift if you take the two post lift uh, once the vehicle is actually lift right once the vehicle is lift you have enough you have a very good access to the all the components underneath the vehicle right even the wheels and everything so you can work very easily underneath but if you go to the scissor lift the problem with the scissor lift is as you can see over there it's the underneath the vehicle is actually covered with the two sections two as you can see over here two planks sort of things right so that actually obstruct the way of the mechanic or whatever you working on so that's a, a one disadvantage of something like this but if you move to the uh, bottom one the multi purpose runaway again even though it's having four posts and the runaway so that means very it can be uh, securely parked inside but the unfortunately again it seems it is having a runaway it's again obstructing the way of the mechanic or whatever the work we are going to do and the other disadvantage you can't actually remove the wheel without again putting a jack right uh, and fourth one if you see the fourth one the fourth one is very different from the other lift the main difference is each so uh, these four uh, you can see there are four legs here so each leg is actually a separate so they are not interconnected and it doesn't it's actually a mobile part so these are actually used for heavy vehicles mostly what you do is uh, what these provide is a lift outside of or uh, instead of using in or instead of bringing the vehicle inside these lift can be taken to the vehicle Right, these fake lifts can be taken to the vehicle there's no hard connection or there's no wires or anything going in between these four lifts they are uh, the, they are battery operated and they are uh, the advantage is they have wi-fi connections or bluetooth connections that uh, communicate with each other one when you can control one uh, from one post it will actually uh, one second, uh, it will actually sorry it will actually lift the whole vehicle why is there so many people in the waiting room okay so the purpose these serve are very different for example uh, two post lifts mostly used mainly used for the mechanics work scissor lifts are mainly used for the exhaust shops and uh, multi purpose runaway lifts used for uh, with tire shops and alignment racks and the mobile lifts are mostly used for heavy vehicles so these are the application wise and uh, there are a lot of things to consider here for example these uh, two post lifts you need to have a very solid base in order to fix these but if you go to the scissor lift since the uh, weight of the vehicle is actually spread in a higher sort of area so it does not need a solid uh, very um, hardened surface but in multi purpose uh, runaway lift again it does not need a very hardened surface but it has to be very level because there are four uh, ports four lift four uh, four ports four posts so these four posts has to be level because mostly these are used for um, 
mostly these are used for alignment racks and the mobile lift units you don't have much of a problem here because uh, only one fourth of the weight of a vehicle will be actually lift by one side but still it needs to have a solid uh, ground in order to lift the vehicle so that being said in order to select a lift for your application or your workshop you need to consider a lot of factors right uh, first thing is purpose of the list uh, what is the purpose it's going to serve is it going to be worked as a alignment rack whether it's going to use a cleaning or for a service center and uh, whether for exhaust work and access underneath the vehicle so once you lift it how much access do you need as we discussed earlier the scissor lift is very easy to use and uh, you don't need a solid uh, flow to fix it but uh, unfortunately your access is limited so you need to consider this and the height restriction height restriction is especially considering with the tool uh, two post lift you can see right you can see over here there's a go back you can see there's a connection in between these two posts right these two posts so that means because of that the vehicles can be only lifted up to a certain height so you can't actually use these for uh, like tall vehicles such as vans so in such cases there are uh, two post lifts which does not actually have this interconnection between these two posts so you have to select something like that and maximum weight need to lift yeah that's another important thing so two post lift uh, not all the two post lifts can uh, lift the same weight usually these can lift up to around 5 tons but uh, just to be safe this needs to have uh, at least like twice the capacity so if only we are working with the cars 5 tons is more than enough but if you are working with something like double cabs and uh, other vehicles you need to have at least 8 ton capacity uh, next one is the safety aspect so most of the uh, lifts actually have an inbuilt locking mechanism so once it goes started to go up it it will uh, even the power loss so if there's any rupture in the uh, hydraulic lifting mechanism if something like that happen in case the lift will not come down because there's a uh, uh, there's a locking mechanism which uh, is fixed inside this uh, post but uh, there are cheap options which actually do not have it so it's very important uh, thing to have because the safety is the number one priority in any uh, given circumstances. So flow requirements and the power consumption. So next one is you need to consider how much of flow uh, hardness. So for example, something like a two post lift actually need at least five inches of concrete flow in order to fix it. It's actually bolted to the concrete flow. So it actually requires around five inches. But if you go to like a four post lift, it need is around like two, three inches like that. Uh, then when number of lift lifting post increase, the or the when the load is actually spreading, you don't need that much of a strength on the floor. The other one is the power consumption. So uh, some are actually need a three phase power. Some only need a single phase power. So you have to consider this as well. The last one is the cost of the lift. There are so many uh, options available with different uh, uh, different uh, different types. Some actually have chains, some actually have cables, some have hydraulic press, hydraulic pistons. So all of the you have to consider all of these and you can consider the or you can add the cost of this item and decide what is the. Uh, best one for your application. So uh, in the bottom image is actually showing a workshop. It's a proper workshop. You can see uh, there is a lot of components there. One important thing you have to see is it's not, uh, there are like two post lifts and there's like a scissor lift. So the red color one is a scissor, right? Red color one is a scissor lift. Please uh, try to remember this image as much as possible because this image we have to discuss about this image. Again, for example, uh, there are some some lines hanging from the top. These are actually known as exhaust studs. These are used in order to uh, run the vehicle inside the 
this confined space uh, because the combustion is uh, because the exhaust is coming out it has to be directed outside from the workshop in order to uh, make the workshop safer place to work that's why these ducting are on the, over the um, over, over the cliffs right so and there's other thing you need to remember is it's not actually uh, uh, you, rather than having the same capacity of the lift so for example uh, you can have like two eight ton capacity lifts and two five ton capacity lifts and save the cost and uh, another one or two uh, scissor lift so scissor lift can be used for working on the um, wheel alignment machine something like that so th that sort of things can be used to save the money here Okay, next component is actually the engine hoist. So, engine hoist is mainly used to uh, pick up the engine from the vehicle uh, engine compartment and bring it out because engine weighs around 200, 250 kilograms. So, we can't actually lift it by ourselves. So, there are two method models actually shown here. Uh, we actually have both of these models available in the laboratory. One is actually the folding engine hoist, the other one is the heavy engine engine hoist so folding engine hoist is uh, the most common version uh, the advantage being is uh, it actually can be folded into like a very small package so you can keep it uh, keep it uh, in one corner when you are not using it but the heavy engine hoist uh, the advantage be it can actually lift higher weight so sometimes it can be like three tons or something so these are actually mostly used for heavy vehicle applications and you can see the bottom that uh, base of is actually very different from the uh, folding engine hoist this base is very sturdy and uh, it's actually designed in a way so you can put it uh, so these two uh, two legs actually goes around the wheel right around the wheel from one side of a vehicle such as a truck so you can easily take the engine out. So um, there are so many things to consider when you are selecting an engine hoist as well. So uh, I prefer rather than me explaining about this one, you can actually consider, you can actually consider about this for, uh, you can actually learn about this. So question, what are the factors need to be considered when selecting an engine hoist, right? So just to give a brief idea, basically you need to consider about the uh, maximum weight it can lift and the second thing uh, how much uh, whether you need it to be folding one or you can just leave it there. this folding one could be a little bit expensive and uh, another one important thing about this engine hoist is you have to consider about this wheel these actually known as caster wheels so there are different types of caster wheels there's a steel ones and there are uh, polyurethane lines and there are teflon wheels and bearing type so these sort of things you very small details has to be considered and uh, for this hydraulic piston so you can see there's a hydraulic piston or hydraulic jack here so these hydraulic jacks either can be manual operated something as shown in the folding engine or this is a manual operator and that manual operated version also have something called a twin action or double action so it doesn't matter which way you are moving your uh, whether you are uh, pumping or whether you are bringing the lever backward up both times the engine hoist will go up and the other one in the heavy engine heavy engine hoist it's actually using pneumatic power right the air pressure from the compressor to lift the hydraulic or uh, lift the engine right so these sort of things you can consider that's what actually you need to consider oh, that is those are the things you have to discuss in this question uh, to give you a brief idea about this um, more brief more brief idea about this selecting an engine hoist uh, i have actually attached a link here you can actually go and watch that link uh, it, uh, they are also the one uh, they also it's discussing what are the things you need to consider right uh, just having a uh, engine hoist is actually not uh, good enough to take a engine out. The disadvantage of an engine 
problem with the engine sorry one second ma'am yes uh, one problem of the engine bay is so it's actually cramped inside the vehicle engine bay is very cramped so in order to bring the vehicle engine out sometimes you need to actually uh, angle it uh, turn it to into an angle so if you are trying to do it usually what do we do is we ask another person to come and uh, uh, push it from the back of the engine to just to make it easier to lift right but uh, that is not the correct way to do it there's a tool right there's a tool or equipment uh to be fixed with the engine uh hoist engine hoist also called as a cherry picker just remember that if you heard something called cherry picker that's also actually falling about it. that uh, that is also uh engine hoist engine hoist so uh this engine lever uh as shown in the second image as shown here it's actually fixed to the uh Uh, it's it will be actually fixed to the engine hoist through this chain and when we turn this crank when we turn this crank the center of gravity will be changed right center of gravity will change which uh, allow the us to actually align or turn the engine uh, into a one direction so we can actually uh, bring the engine out easily that's why this uh, that is the importance of this equipment so there's a link again you can actually see how this one operate uh the next one is engine and transmission support bar this is a very important components that usually we don't use usually we don't have this uh, tool in most of our workshop uh same for the end load lever right engine load lever uh that's also no very hard to find in our workshops in sri lanka because most people try to cut uh corners and since it is it's not actually expensive item but uh, most people think it's not necessary but if you have both of these like load lever as well as the engine hoist one single person can actually take the engine out without any trouble that's why this company uh, this equipment uh, is there so engine transmission support bar so engine transmission support bar this uh, equipment or this uh, one is actually used to uh, keep the engine in place while the bottom supporting brackets or supporting components removed from the engine for example uh yeah for example if assume that uh, for some reason you have to remove the engine cradle so engine cradle means uh, yes i will give a small explanation but is engine cradle so in a vehicle as you know uh vehicles are no uh, nowadays modern vehicles are actually having integrated chassis model. right so chassis and body is actually integrated into one single compound right so but still uh uh engine is actually not directly blow uh, directly uh, attached into the uh, body frame right or your integrated chassis instead of doing like that it's actually bolted something called uh, engine cradle right engine cradle then bolted into the uh frame or we call it as the integrated chassis right the advantage of the doing this is uh to make it easier for uh manufacturing right so if you see any manufacturing video you might have seen the body of the vehicle and the, all the components inside components is assembled in one area and the chassis oh, sorry uh, the engine uh, gearbox wheels those suspension components assembled in a separate area both of them then late finally comes together right so this step is possible because something called engine cradles there so engine is actually bolted to engine cradle uh, front suspension arms and everything components uh, all the components are also joined to the uh, bottom of the uh, engine cradle so these components can be assembled separately and the body and everything else can be assembled separately finally these two can be ma married together this actually this step that a particular step that combine these two uh, body and the drive train components actually called as marriage so this is possible that that step make it possible and this step reduces the cost as well as the time of manufacturing 
So that allow us to have something called an engine cradle. So engine cradle, on top of the engine cradle, you have the engine mount. So for example, if you have to remove the engine mounts of a vehicle, sometimes it's so difficult to uh, get into the engine mount from the top of the engine, but it's very easy to get to the engine mounts from the bottom of the engine. But the problem is once you remove the engine bore mounts, the engine will actually drop on top of the, uh, there's no support once you remove the engine. So in such cases, if you have to suspend the engine while removing all the other supporting components, mounts, cradle, or any other components, you can actually use this engine transmission support bar, right? As shown here on the on your right side, it's actually showing an image that it's actually supported. So it's the engine uh, and the engine is actually hanged onto these. So these two actually, uh, this bar is supported by the body frame. Okay. Next one is a transmission jack. So transmission jack use mainly used for uh, removing the transmission from uh, vehicles. So there are two types of transmission jacks, high lift transmission jacks and low uh, jack to use with car jacks. So the, 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 the high lift car transmission jack is mainly used with uh, when you are working underneath the vehicle while the vehicle is lift by using a two post or four post or some sort of a lift. But the low jack can be used uh, while you are working underneath the vehicle while still the vehicle is on top of uh, on top of uh, um, while the vehicle is actually jacked by the car jacks, right? So that's the difference between these two. But uh, you can see that uh, low jack is seems to have like a very sleek design. Can be uh, the space required for this one is actually smaller comparing to the high lift jack and the other uh, one more component this is also something you can't find you it's very hard to find this component also in sri lanka but this is also one important component so as i told you earlier the most vehicles actually have this uh, cradle so engine and right rein all these components are combined together they are in a separate package so uh, this separate package should be able to actually taken out so taking this component, this complete section is a difficult task. What we usually do is at the moment, what we usually do is, uh, uh, um, we, we, uh, we remove the underneath of the cradle bolts from the underneath and bring the vehicle up to the lowest probable position and remove the bolts and from the top, right? Once you do that, everything will be taken out. But uh, there's another solution that you can actually lift engine and gearbox combination from the combined engine and gearbox from the bottom of the vehicle without any trouble. That's why we have something called a cradle jack, right? Powertrain cradle jack. So advantage of this jack is uh, the taking engine and gearbox using this uh, engine hoist actually takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time because uh, you have to shoe on. Uh, through a small hole on the top of the vehicle to bring this out. You have to take it into an angle and very hard to take it out. But uh, if you drop it below, right? If you try to drop it below, it's an easy, uh, it's an easy option, right? So that's why this uh, powertrain cradle jack is there. Uh, remember, this, this is a very good option for removing and assembling a vehicle component. For example, very simple example. I can give a very good example. Uh, you know that um, hybrid, uh, nowadays, what is this? Vezara line GP5, uh, what do you call that? Yeah, Honda Vezara line, Honda GP5s, they actually need to replace their clutch plate. So this clutch plate replacement work is actually very difficult work because you have to completely drop the whole engine and dismantle it. So remove the engine from the gearbox and put a new clutch and all the components and fix it back. And doing it while the engine is engine and everything is uh, inside the vehicle is impossible because gearbox is the lowest position in the engine. So it's not it's very difficult work. But if you have certain component like this, some certain equipment like this, very easily you can take the engine out uh, from the bottom and fix uh, remove the everything and fix it back. 
and put it back together within like few hours right so this sort of equipment is again important so again what are the factors you should check when you are selecting a cradle jack so to answer this question uh, the answers are actually provided through this youtube video i hope you will be having time to look into this okay now next one is engine start so yes uh engine stand is actually used for disassembling and assembling work so uh, something to easily disassemble and assemble an engine so as you can see over in the image on the first row the first one is actually showing the engine uh, stand right engine stand so you can see there's like a black sort of a plate on the top of that that's actually a adjustable uh it's actually have something like adjustable arms that you can actually change and fix into the uh flywheel side of the or uh gearbox side of the engine bay sorry in not engine bay engine right directly you can fix it to there and uh, you can rotate to every side and remove the components easily so this is a ergonomically important component and if you go look at the next side it's actually add on components that blue uh, blue color component is add on to the engine stand for uh, supporting the transmission so transmission do not have a separate uh, support or stand like this there are add on components for transmission but the disadvantage of transmission is since transmissions do not have the same uh, fixing ability similar to so Uh, because transmission have different layout or different shapes uh, these uh, uh, these uh, mounts or these adapters are not actually you know sir you have to purchase separate mostly separate uh, ones for at least for different manufacturers right for example toyota has different gearbox and factory gearboxes and nissan has different gearboxes so these gearbox types need different adapters uh before you ask it's possible to use the uh bell housing to fix the engine or the bell housing to fix it to the engine stand but unfortunately the problem here is once you fix it to the bell housing uh you can't actually dismantle the engine because the so once you fix it to the bell housing it's unfold and difficult to dismantle the gearbox because most components gear uh, most of the components of the gearbox has to be taken out from the uh, bell housing side or you have to split in half gearbox housing has to be split in half so because of that difficulty you need to have a different adapters for different gearboxes right so that's why uh, uh, the universal adapter is not available for these okay so oil drain uh, as it seems oil drain is used to drain the oil and collect the oil one important thing about the oil is uh, oil is actually recyclable you can actually collect the oil and uh, recycle or you can actually sell it there are vendors who comes and collect the oil and they take it up to some other application so because of that because one advantage of this oil is a very easy you can burn it, right so uh, because of such applications these oil you should not actually release them to the environment you should uh, collect them in a dolly or uh, oil draining dolly something like uh, shown here and uh, hand it over back to uh, these collecting vendors the advantage of uh, something like this uh, once you pressurize this there's a uh, air inlet on this so you can actually pressure compressed air into this tank and uh, drain the whole system very easily and uh, this funnel sort of thing over the this section over here actually has a, a net in that so because of that even if you drop your bolt or something it won't actually go into the drain cell so it's actually very secure option to use next one is actually air compressor one of the 
most important uh, components in any uh, any uh, workshop most uh, workshops actually have it and uh, if not most workshops should need to have it so uh, it's used as a power source for pneumatic components and it's also used as a method to clean uh, components right so, uh, because of the high pressure air yeah, it's easy to clean the component so air compressor combined with the pneumatic circuit actually power the uh, pneumatic tools so when you go to select a compressor there are so many things you have to consider right what is your use so what is your use means if you are using for uh, painting there are different types of compressors if you are just using for running the machinery there's a different types right and optimum pressure you needed for the system so if you are running like a uh, heavy pneumatic guns you need to have more than 10 bars right at least 10 bar you need to have 10 bar of pressure so in order to deliver that you need a higher capacity or at least three stages three stages of uh, pressurizing so that sort of machine you have to purchase which is expensive and how much of capacity so if you have more than one machine or more than one pneumatic machine pneumatic impact guns or something you are using then mean you need more capacity so what type of compressor should be purchased so what type of compressor means there are different types of compressors so there are quiet compressors or muffled compressors which do not make any noise and there are compressors uh, that actually make noise right that actually make noise and there are as shown in these two images there are horizontal machines and there are vertical machines so you have to consider which one you have to use you can decide on the space you have and where you're going to keep it if you're going to keep it on inside the uh, workshop it's not possible to uh, use actually a normal one you need to keep it somewhere else outside because these are actually uh, producing around 108 decibels or something like that and electrical system some of these machines are actually only run on three phase systems some actually have single phase systems and the cost of the equipment so you have to comprise and compromise on all of these and come up with the model or come up with the com uh, compressor for your application uh, another one com important component here shown so this is actually not available in most of the workshop because usually what we use is we just use simple water so this is actually a part washer right pass washer so parts washer is a very important equipment that uh, more we, we, we actually need to have it in any workshop the advantage of this uh, pass washer is these can actually deliver higher pressure than the running water or the tap line and uh, they are doing it in a confined space so water or the other dirt and everything will not be goes into the environment these actually have like a filtering mechanism which actually trap all the contamination uh, components inside that we can actually clean later instead of putting it into the uh, environment and the there are additional additional there are automated systems as shown in the bottom left image that's actually a automated pass washer you just put all your parts in it and you secure them and put it inside and turn it on uh, some of these pass washers even use like uh, hot water hot water is a very good uh, solution in uh, cleaning uh, small particles because uh, uh, they tend to remove contaminations very easily and the uh, other image or the bottom right side photo is actually showing an ultrasonic cleaner. Ultrasonic cleaner is not something almost all the uh, workshops should have because it's one of the things is it's expensive. But uh, um, uh, a place like a engine rebuilding shop or a machine shop could actually uh, use uh, something like a ultrasonic cleaner. So ultrasonic cleaners are uh, Wow, very uh, very good cleaning solution. For example, just to give you an example, so uh, inside the engine bay, for example, you say there's a vehicle ran for 30 years now. Uh, the engine uh, inside the engine block, you have mud 
and all the water and the corrosion is actually de developed inside the uh, inside inside cavities of the engine block. So these cavities could not be cleaned off, uh, cleaned from any of the components, but it is any of the um, previously discussed parts cleaning methods. So for such applications, you have to use something like this, right? Something like ultrasonic cleaner. Ultrasonic cleaner uses this ultrasonic signals to clean the um, uh, surfaces and it does not matter whether it's inside or outside because everything happening is uh, inside of a uh, bath. So you, once you put it on inside the bath, then you turn it on. And the other benefit of it is uh, you can actually uh, uh, actually uh, change how much of uh, frequency you have to use, how much of temperature, everything you can change. So by changing these things, uh, you can actually get very good results. So there are so many links I have attached here. Uh, how does the ultrasound cleaner works? Uh, and uh, just showing how it is working, benefits of the ultrasonic cleaner. Right, so you can actually go through this. Uh, this particular machine is actually industrial version, but there's a small version also very tabletop sort of versions that uh, we uh, even use in uh, laboratory practicals for materials technology. We actually have a small ultrasound cleaner for cleaning components because it's actually provide a very good result. Okay, so next we go into some. Uh, simple things that we can actually need in the workshop. First one is the creeper. Creeper is, these are actually ergonomic components that uh, ergonomic equipment that, that provide us uh, easy working environment. So the one, first one is actually sort of like a seat that you can sit and walk uh, because it's having casters. You can work around the vehicle very easily. And the second one is actually again creeper that uh, you lie on and uh, goes underneath the vehicle easily. Uh, the bottom you can see a drain pan. These sort of drain pans mainly, mainly used for collecting the uh, collecting the coolant. So coolant should not be collected. You can actually collect the coolant using the oil drain, but uh, once you mix coolant with the oil, drain, oil uh, the, you can't actually use the oil again. So because of that, we usually use a certain a uh, component like this, so something like a drain pan, right? Then uh, collect um, collect uh, coolant into it and put the coolant back to a, a tank for recycling. So one very important, com uh, uh, this is more like a tool than equipment, is a magnetic pan. So you usually know that uh, usually in a vehicle when you're working in a vehicle it's always our nuts and bolts we get missing so we can use something like this this is actually magnet pans these are available everywhere so you can actually have it anywhere in the vehicle or the your toolbox or somewhere you can just put your uh you can put your nut or nut or bolt or whatever it is whatever metal it is it will not move anywhere you will not lose that so that's why we have magnetic tool and the other thing is uh, we need is a workshop bench. Okay, so workshop bench. So workshop bench is um, very important uh, because uh, workshop bench is where you usually do most of the works. Once you uh, disassemble it from the vehicle, you bring it to the workshop bench and you do whatever you have to do it over there. So uh, we can use from either steel or wood benches. You can select either one, but uh, steel ones are easier to use relatively and they are not heavy as much as the wood ones because of the sturdy construction, wood ones are very heavy and very difficult to move. Uh, be bench and uh, one uh, added advantage of wood and steel benches are they have adjustable legs, height adjusting legs, so you can actually make it very level on the surface. And uh, as you can see on the image, there's like a guard going around three sides of the table that allows uh, 
that will not allow anything to fall over something uh, because most of the components in the, the vehicles are rotating components so these can actually drop from the table to avoid that only we have that sort of a thing and um, uh, we can fix the appropriate size jaw uh, appropriate size uh, wise um, so we can use it regularly and uh, you can see there's an image shown here so this is also a workshop bench but this is more like a custom application which you have the workshop bench and tools and everything in the uh, in the cabinet itself so this is a very good application but uh, for something like a uh, something like a business sort of a thing this is not the best uh, solution because as you can see tools and everything is here so you can't move the tools you have to bring all the components here and do the works and go back but uh, in a application like as shown in the previous workshop it's important to have a, a tool cabinet that you can move so here tool cabinet cannot be moved and the space is also very limited as you can see because the, thick of, uh, the width of the table is limited and the space uh, you can't actually walk around it so there's like problems here so even this is actually a very good application of a workbench when you have a very confined space like a garage or your your probably like your home garage you can have something like that because you have a lot of storage as well as the table so this is a good example but if you go to like a more commercial solution this is not the best way to do it so what are the factors you need to consider when selecting a workshop bench? So you can discuss certain things like that. Again, comes to the storage. Now, so as we discussed earlier, storage is a very important thing. So once we come to the storage, there are two things we have to consider, equipments, tools, and uh, tools and equipments, and components and parts. So Proper storage is very important in the workshops. Once if you have proper storage that provide us to clean, keep the workshop clean as well as to keep the workshop flow or the uh, workflow running very great. So here the red one is actually known as a tool cabinet. We usually might have seen in the workshop. We also have these tool cabinets. Tool cabinets is a very good option. If you are actually having something like a commercial workshop. So whenever you need, you can actually take this tool cabinet to a, uh, one station, something like two posts or four posts or somewhere, you can go and work there. So on top of the tool cabinet, you can see there's like a flat space. This is also a workbench. So this can be, this is one of the very good solutions for a, a commercial application. The second one shown here, when to your right is actually something you can use for your home garage, home garage and very small scale garage or specialized garage. So where you only do a certain small works and or you are doing the same work again and again. In such cases, you can use something like that. Uh, for example, if you are only uh, doing works related to exhaust only. So you don't need all the tools and everything. You can just bring the exhaust and do all the works here and take it back. So for something like that, the second option is very good for everything else. This is the, uh, the right uh, tool cabinet piece. The, this rolling tool cabinet is a very good option. Again, when you are selecting a tool cabinet, also you have to consider about the weight, how much is cost, uh, what is the, uh, how many cab, how many trays are there, how much of space are there. So everything can have to be considered. So these uh, uh, can be purchased with or without tools. So you can either, buy it with tools so you can either buy out the tools when it comes to uh, part storage uh, one good option is trolleys so uh, as you can see on the top image it's actually a trolley uh, once you disassemble like engines and all the components you can't uh, you should not actually move it by your hand so it uh, it's actually could actually damage our spine and our body so we use something like a um trolley so what we do is we load all the components in the trolley and push it up to the long term storage it's shown in the bottom row so for like small nuts and bolts we can actually use something like a small shelves 
as shown in the uh, uh, bottom left side image and for larger components we can actually use uh, shelves like shown in the bottom right uh, right side and uh, there are uh, folding and uh, folding shelves that we can move back and forth so the space you don't have to keep the space in between the shelves for working you can just uh, pack it into one and you can move to one side right uh, next one is actually floor jacks there are two types of floor jacks are available one is actually trolley jack other one is actually known as bottle jack so trolley jack is actually shown in the right side of the image and the sorry left side of the image and the uh, right side is actually shown the bottle jack so jacks are sorry uh, main specification of a jack is the how much of weight it can uh, take and uh, one another important factor you have to consider is how low is your vehicle so for example if you see this if you look at this uh, trolley jet uh, you can see there's like a step down design right step down design here so this step down design allow to uh, push this underneath the vehicle even even if the vehicle is actually very low to the ground that means the ground clearance is very low but in the bottle jack scenario, it needs to have a certain amount of clearance in the vehicle in order to use this jack. So that's a small disadvantage. So you have to consider about these sort of things. Uh, jack stand, also known as axle stands, uh, these are actually used for uh, securing the vehicle once it's actually lifted. If you are working underneath any vehicle, you always have to use these axle stands. So axle stands also are rated for like five tons, 10 tons or something. So if you are using like uh, two ton vehicles, it's always advised to use uh, around the 12, twice the capacity of the vehicle's weight. So there's no way it's going to break. And uh, it is not advisable to only use the jack uh, to keep the vehicle. If you are using a jack, always you have to use jack stands because jacks have a hydraulic fluid there's a possibility that could actually go down even in case some time to accident somehow if some person release the jack in case in such cases we need to make sure to have jack stands wheel dolly another important equipment which we mostly don't have instead of using the wheel dolly most of the time what we do is we use the uh, trolley jack but uh, instead of using the trolley jack, we stand is a simpler option. But we, uh, we, as shown in the image on your right side, wheel dolly, uh, we put the wheel dolly underneath the uh, tire. So when the vehicle is, uh, even though vehicle is, in such cases, if the vehicle is impossible to start, even though still we have to move it, in such cases, we can actually use this wheel dolly advantage is these are having a caster wheel so uh, we can actually turn into any direction if they're very confined space so that's very advantageous for you so next one is the exhaust ducts as i told you earlier exhaust ducts is a very important thing actually we need to have in workshop which unfortunately i haven't seen in any of the workshops the advantage is uh, so when uh, so you can see you might have seen uh, when uh, mechanics are working in the vehicle, they actually keep the vehicle engine running. So while they are looking or checking something. So in such cases, the uh, carbon monoxide gas is actually coming out. It's not good to inhale. So it's important to take it out and collect it and take it out as much as, as soon as possible. So that's why these exhaust ducts are available. So this is actually, this should be a must in any workshop. So grease machines, as you know, grease machines are used to put grease into uh, components such as suspension components. These are actually powered by pneumatic. Or oh, there's manual grease mines, grease machines are also there. Pressure washer is mainly used to uh, clean the vehicle and uh, parts you know how pressure washer is i don't think i have to explain about the pressure washer that much so hydraulic press yes hydraulic press is another very important equipment most of the workshops do not have it 
uh, most of the, the model makers, especially nowadays, makers actually have most components like bearings, uh, suspension components, these actually press fit, right? These are actually press fit. So in order to remove this, either you have to hammer or you have to use a uh, hammer it very hard. You have to hammer it or you can use something like this. So rather than using a hammer, it's always beneficial to use a hydraulic jack similar to this one. Uh, you can remove bearings and any uh, suspension components very easily using this. And uh, in addition to that, this can be used to remove the uh, valve springs. Uh, very easily valve springs can be removed rather than using a valve spring compressor. Uh, this is not that expensive equipment, but it's uh, somewhat expensive by most uh, workshops. I have not seen in most workshops using it as you can know. If there's suspension work, you have to remove it and drag it to uh, some other place there where I will press is there and uh, remove your suspension mount so bearings or something and take it to a shop and bring it. So, but by having this, <coughs> this problem can be actually fixed. So question here is what are the factors need to be considered when selecting a hydraulic press for your workshop? So yeah basically you have to consider how much of space so you can see there's like holes on the two railings two vertical railings these holes actually allow the uh, bottom uh, this this tray or this support to be moved back and forth allowing it to have more space between the jack and the component so uh, and how much of pressure you need to add but sort of a jack is there so you can actually see this is a um, this one actually using a bottle jack but there are applications which actually use a dedicated hydraulic press with the pressure indicator as well so you can actually read up how much pressure is uh, applied there uh, next one is battery charger and or oh, jumper so this this, as you know, is for uh, starting the vehicle. If the vehicle is parked for a long time, it's need a jump start because the battery is dead. So in such cases, you can use something like this. Uh, what are the factors you need to consider when buying a jump start? Kit? So I think you can find the answer for that. I'm not going to discuss further about this. Uh, yeah, so RAM. So RAMs is another important component so in such case that you can't put your jack right the, if the jack space or the space underneath the vehicle is not enough to put the jack or in even the jack instead of using the jack you if you can lift the vehicle using a ram this is actually more safer than using a jack right there's less chance of this actually breaking or uh, collapsing than ramp so these can be used to increase the ground clearance without using a jack so uh, available with load uh, different load capacities to purchase or you can actually make it with the steel okay next uh, we move to the steel sorry next uh, we move back to the tools so uh, once we go to the tools Hope you have, um, uh, before we move into the tools, uh, do you have any questions about the part we already discussed? We have, uh, that's one hour. I have been talking for one hour. Do you have anything to like ask any questions or anything like that? Okay, yes, not. Okay, so once we go to the tools, uh, tools are very important as you know. Uh, so, okay, using a proper tool for the job is very important. If not, it could damage the vehicle and the user. That's one important thing. So tools, we can divide into power tools and hand tools. 
So power tools again divide into power uh, electric power tools and pneumatic power tools. A uh, few years back, like ten or twenty years ago, if we consider that the pneumatic power tools were considered to be superior with the power and how much of work they can do and how much of torque they can deliver, but uh, nowadays electric power tools uh, are actually also matching with them and. In addition to the electric power tools, actually do not need a cord. So now we have cord electric power tools. So seems like uh, we can uh, we can actually use without uh, we can actually operate without pneumatic power tools nowadays. But still, there are advantages of disadvantages of this, uh, which we will be discussing later. Okay, so first one is range. So again, uh, from here onwards, no one can use the wrong word inside the workshop. And my prefer if you use as much as English inside the workshops when you are doing the practicals and all. So uh, that's why I'm actually teaching this. One of the main reasons to teach this is you actually don't know the names of these words, right? So Mostly, what we call this, this we actually known as uh, uh, spanner, spanner or range, right? That's all we know it. We call all of these actually spanner. So these actually have specific names and these actually have specific sizes, right? Specific sizes and specific names. So once you come to the sizes, there's metric and imperial sizes. Metric sizes usually comes in millimeters and imperial sizes are comes in. Uh, inches so most modern vehicles do not not most none of the modern vehicles actually do not use imperial sizes they only use uh, uh, metric sizes so that means millimeter sizes right so uh, once you come to these ranges there's like open-ended range it's shown here and combination range and close range range and off offset close range range so each of these are actually designed for specific applications, right? They are designed for specific applications. But one thing you have to remember, uh, you have to reduce the times you are using open-ended ranges as much as possible. Because open-ended ranges do not have covering it all the way. The support for the bolt is actually, bolt or nut is actually less, as you can See here, there's no support this way, right? So this is a disadvantage when you are trying to loosen or tighten the bolt. So this could actually damage. So as much as possible, you have to use closed end ranges. In case only if you can't use it, in case if you can't only use only use a closed end range only, you should use an open end range, right? And once we go to the closed end range also, you can see this closed range, they are like edges, right? So these edges, these edges, right? These edges uh, will actually protrude into the uh, board itself. So there's like six sides, six sides, so six pointers and 12 point. So most common version is 12 point version because 12 point version provide more uh, utilization, especially in confined spaces and inside the engine and uh, vehicle. So most people try to use, most people uh, prefer the 12 sided version, but six side version is better because six side version provide more support once you are trying to lose an entire. So uh, basically what I'm trying to say here is, uh, 12-sided version can actually easily slip and damage the bolt. But if you go to the six-sided version or six uh, edges version, that actually have more grip on the bolt. Okay. Mm. So we have these. Next, we have deep offset closed range range. So if you look at the offset range and the deep offset range, the length, uh, 
between here and here this length is actually higher it has more length in the deep deep end uh, range right that's why it's so these are, as i told you earlier there's different applications for them then combination ratchet strain range so you can see over here there's a ratchet in this side of the range and you have double ended ratchet ranges as shown here and you have flexed ratchet range so flexed means uh, there's a joint here so you can actually turn so it is easier to use okay we'll go to the next slide uh next one is actually you knows flared nut ranges so this is mainly used for removing brake lines so technically speaking you should not use the open ended ranges in brake nuts brake nuts are very um, very thin nuts it could actually damage so you need to use a brake nut brake line nut range so also known as flared nut ranges right so this is a a uh, tool that most of the shops actually do not have they actually use that the other open ended range and uh, end up damaging the brake lines torque wrench uh, torque wrench is actually used to tighten the bolts or nuts up to a uh, provided uh, torque right so that's why the torque wrench is there it's actually known as a, a drive type also which i will explain later and we have the adjustable wrenches you can adjust its size and we have socket wrench so socket wrench is a important component so socket wrench so socket wrench uh, we have to use the so basically when we are working in the vehicle or engine uh, for any tool any hand tools any wrenches wise the first uh, selection should be a socket wrench second selection should be the closed end trogens closed end uh, sorry uh, second uh, solution uh, second option we should go for is the closed end wrenches third option is the open end wrenches but i know most of you will directly go to the open end wrenches that is actually wrong so adjustable wrench is also we should not use unless it's absolutely necessary right adjustable range provide you the adjustability but unfortunately the support from the adjustable range to the bolt is very low so it can actually easily damage the bolt or not right so to avoid that you should avoid using the adjustable range as much as possible right so next we comes to the um, ratchet range right ratchet range So ratchet, or I'll call it as a ratchet. It's easier for me to use it as ratchet because we usually use it as ratchet. So ratchet is actually combined with the socket we actually use. So again, you are not allowed to use any other words to be sockets. Other than sockets, you can't use it hello or any other thing other word or anything. You have to use ratchet, right? That's the technical term, and you will be using technical term here and out. so the advantage of this actually is it provide more grip and effective operation and it would not damage the uh, bolts or nuts as much as in the other other tools that we discussed earlier so there are two sides of a socket you have might have seen as shown here right so there's one side which actually connected to the connect to the uh, ratchet so this side is actually known as driver socket side and the other side is actually goes to the bolt so here it's actually have a square side so this is actually known as the drive so drivers actually comes in five imperial drive sizes these are coming in inches that's why it's imperial so they are one fourth uh third way to half three quarter and one inch so these are the driver sizes available for each and every driver sizes different socket sizes are available for example 14 uh, is the smallest size of driver size so at that particular driver size you have like 6 uh, mm uh, sockets from 6 mm 
from six millimeter. Uh, from six millimeter, like up to the um, like twelve or something. But if you go to like one inch, you can actually use it for large diameters. The larger uh, ball size, like thirty-two millimeter, something like that. Um, and yeah, so uh, this actually uh, locked into the ratchet driver. So over here, there's like a small bolt goes into the notch over here. So once it goes into the notch, it will not come out unless you press the button on top of the ratchet that's how it's actually secured here so when once you go to the sockets again sockets have different sizes sockets actually have millimeter sizes and uh, these again have points or edges like this similar to the uh, ranges or closed end ranges we discussed earlier so these also have 600 or six points or 12 points. So again, as much as possibly try to use the six uh, ended points, but if it is not possible, you can go for 12. So there's not much to discuss here, but uh, one important thing here is sockets have two different colors. If it is coming in matte black, right? If it is coming in matte black color, uh, the purpose of that matte black color, uh, so the use of this matte black color ones is uh, to be used in heavy applications, right? They are coming in heavy applications. So heavy applications such as uh, pneumatic impact guns. So they are actually specifically manufactured for uh, impact guns. The other ones are actually comes in different colors, can be silver, nickel color, or even in purple. Uh, black also is available, but it's not matte black. If it is matte black only, it's for heavy uh, use. Okay, now we'll move into what are the, what type of sockets are available. Okay, so here when we are talking about the specific sizes of the sockets, we have to uh, specify it with the number of points, drive size, and millimeter size of the balls. So since its millimeter size is not visible here, but I have explained is one pulse drive, six point deep sockets, right? It's actually not deep socket, this is shallow socket. The first one is actually wrong, I have fixed that. Uh, so one fourth drive, the drive size is one fourth, six point. Six points are available in the socket side, uh, board side. And uh, it's normal socket, you have to see how much of side. Uh, so this deep socket and the shallow socket, these two have to interchange. So deep socket means you can see it's actually lengthier. Socket is lengthier, so these can be used for applications such as uh, uh, spark plugs, but there are special spark plug sockets also available. Uh, and uh, you have 12 point uh, half inch shallow socket. Shallow socket means the shorter sockets and the 12 point deep sockets again, that means uh, there's 12 points here and six points here. So here you can actually see a spark plug socket, the difference between the spark plug socket and the uh, deep socket is that the spark plug socket actually has an Okay, so Yes, 20 send a message saying that is a big network problem. Some can some can log in and me also automatically from the meeting. That's fine, it's not a big deal. You can just oh, yes, sorry. You can just watch the video separately. Yeah, we will go back to the uh where we left. Okay. Yeah, so uh, this driver size and the difference is this size. So this one, uh, the um, spark plug socket, it actually has a ball head on the other side. So you can even use another range, right? You can even use a range to uh, actually loosen this instead of using the uh, 
instead of using the ratchet or any other driver you can actually use a socket to loose this so that's why it's actually different from the other socket types then you have the allen sockets and impact drive sockets as you can see this impact drive sockets actually have a different color so they are actually matte black not um, like a shiny black it's actually matte black so these are for impact drivers that's why it's actually matte black and you have something called mail strokes this shape of screws actually called as strokes so these have a different applications most uh, german manufacturers uh, actually use this sort of bolts and nuts okay then we have the mail strokes Sorry, this is actually the male throw socket. This one should be female uh, throw socket, and uh, something called a crow foot socket. Uh, you should actually check what is this crow foot socket. Crow foot socket is actually something uh, fixed into uh, like something like a ratchet, but it's actually have a uh, it's actually a open in range that you can actually fix to the that can be fixed to the ratchet. Then you have the screwdriver socket, different screwdriver sockets are also available. So next one is lug nut socket. So lug nut socket is actually a, a sort of like a deep and a deep socket, which only have six ends, right? Six points only. So these actually only have six points. These never comes with 12 points or 12 sides. These never comes with 12 points. They only come with six points and they come with different colors. In addition to that, they have a sleeve like this. So this white color sleeve is actually a plastic sleeve. This provide the protective uh, protection to the wheel itself. When these actually, when we are trying to loosen and tighten the lug nuts of a wheel, uh, it could actually damage our paint in the wheel by scratching it uh, because we usually end up rubbing against it so to avoid that these actually have this plastic sleeve around them okay next we have the angle socket range set so again it's a six in socket range uh, this has like 90 degrees angle and uh, you have oil filler socket set so oil figures uh, has a specific uh, socket types that uh, you can only use for oil fillers, right? Oil filter, you can actually close no tighten using these. And uh, universal oil filter socket is also available. This will be adjusted to the size of the uh, particular uh, oil filter. Again, in this case, also, oil filter socket set is actually more safe to use than the universal oil filter socket. Uh, so next we have the socket add-ons. So these are actually add-ons between the socket and the uh, driver or ratchet or whatever it uh, whatever it's actually used to rotate it. So first one is extensions. Extensions comes in different sizes. It comes like two inches, four inches, six inches. It's actually explained with the drive size and the length of it right so these are again comes in uh, uh, inches the length so these provide uh, these actually utilize uh, utilize it's easy it's provide the easy use right then uh, universal joint universal joints as you know similar to universal joints so whenever there's like a hard to reach places by combining extensions and universal joints you can actually pro, uh, get necessary support or necessary uh, or you can actually use these socket ranges or they are uh, next one is driver adapter ranges so this is like uh, change the driver size for like one fourth uh, if the socket is actually one fourth but the driver size is having like uh, uh, half inch in such cases you can use an adapter to reduce the drive size from half inch to one fourth right so that's why the drive adapters are there then we have uh, socket drive units there are like 
for and the drive in is first one we can use is a sliding t handle and the sliding t handle we have seen this and the l bar l bar is like a uh, as the name suggests it's like a l bar the advantage is if you need more force or you need to more torque to be added you can actually increase the length by adding a pipe in here a uh, speed handle is there so speed handle uh, these are used to like uh, easily um, remove like a longer balls so speed handle means uh, the reason for call this as a speed handle is it's actually like a crank application so you can uh, re uh, easily dismantle and assemble next one is impact drivers are also available so you can uh, directly fix the impact drive into the tool and remove it or assemble it or disassemble it. And the second one is actually something called a breaker bar. Breaker bars are actually used to breaking the ball. So once you tighten it completely and you torque it, the bolts are snugly fit. So removing it using a, something like a ratchet is not a good application or good solution that could actually end up damaging your ratchet because it's having a very small complicated mechanism inside which could actually damage it if you put too much force. So in such cases, break bars are available. Break bars are available in different length. So you can use the break bar to uh, break the uh, nut. So for example, as shown in the uh, image, you can actually use such one for breaking the wheel nut. So you know that uh, when we have to remove wheel, what we do is we put a pipe to it and increase the length. So that's what actually this provide. So next, we comes to the um, screwdrivers. There's like a lot of screwdriver types. Yeah. So yeah. So it will take another half an hour. I hope you guys are okay. We have to discuss and finish it off. So there are different types of screwdrivers are available. Mainly screwdrivers are deep, uh, uh, specifications depend on the head or the tip size. So there's like Phillips and uh, flat head also known as uh, yeah, usually we call it as flat head and uh, we uh, specifications are comes with the diameter of the uh, shank or the this section this section is actually called as the shank right shank and this is the handle right this rubber section is the handle this is the uh, shank so how we specify these is the length of the shank into the diameter of the shank, right? Plus head type. So that means uh, Phillips eight millimeter, two or two millimeter. Uh, that means here, for example, this uh, particular screwdriver is Phillips head. 8 millimeter into 202 millimeter is the specification for this particular uh, screwdriver. Uh, but there are added uh, things here. One thing is you can see there's like a magnetic tip here. So black color is uh, specified. Uh, black color tip is coming for magnetic hardened magnetic tip is actually comes with black color on the uh, starting end of the screwdriver and you can see another thing here right there's like a metal uh, end of, to this handle there the reason for that is it's actually connected like this all the way through the handle so in case if you need to hit a bolt or in case you have to hit a screw to loosen it so this sort of a screwdriver you have to use you should not use the other one because other one the the shank will not come through the handle. So when if you try to uh, hit it with a hammer or something, it will actually break the handle instead of actually break losing the screw. Okay. So that's why it's actually having this metal piece behind it. And in some cases, these actually have like a six, like a hexagonal head. So these are actually used to, uh, in such cases, you can actually put a wrench over it then try to loosen or you can actually get additional supporting loosening it.
Okay. So here we have different types of uh, screw heads. There's like a lot of screw heads. So I hope uh, you will actually go through different types of uh, screw heads. I'm not actually planning to go through all of these screw heads. You just need to know there's like screw heads, but if you wish to know why these type of screw heads are there, why different types of screw heads are there, why different shapes are there, uh, I have attached some links. You can actually go through them and uh, read them. So that's added information and uh, additional information and it could be more useful for you. Okay, next we have pliers. So there's a lot of pliers we actually use, but uh, there's more than around 30, ty 30 types of pliers are available. But uh, we only use certain pliers in like automotive applications. So we will be discussing on the, them. So we have needle nose plier, battery plier. Battery plier is mainly used for uh, battery terminals. And snap ring pliers, snap ring pliers are used to remove like uh, circuits. And uh, bent nose pliers to reach places that are hard to reach. And brakes spring plier, this is a specific special tool that used to use for uh, drum brakes. Drum brakes, you have seen a spring is there. So for compressing that spring, we have to use this um, plier and combination plier, which is the most common one, flat nose plier. Post grip plier, this is another important plier that we have, we can use, especially in the vehicles when we have to remove small horses horses and pipes sort of things and vice grip plier you know vice grip plier is like also known as the locking plier oil filter plier which used to remove the oil filter and uh, piston ring plier which allow us to expand the piston rings in order to remove the spring oh ring plier wow. and sheet metal plier to keep two sheet metals joined together while you are doing like welding sort of things uh, tongue and row plier, this is sort of like a locking plier, so you can actually keep it in different places and tight it so it will keep in one location, one specific way. Split joint plier, so you can actually make it larger or smaller. And crimping plier, we usually use for electrical works to clean, remove the insulation. So, next one is hammers, so there's like Again, a lot of hammer types are there, but few hammer types. Hammer application of the hammer is uh, very less in vehicles because these are uh, perfectly precision built components. So very rarely you actually have to use a hammer, but in some cases you actually have to use. Uh, so what are the specification uh, you will check when you are selecting a hammer? So how do you actually select a hammer? I actually have to ask the question. Anyone, any answers? I think you learned this in workshop technology module. How do you select a hammer? Where are the place we are using? The hammer, okay. the purpose. Yes. Why we are you for one work we are doing? Why what the purpose of that hammer? Where we want to use like that we can. Yes. Uh, what is the specification usually even with the hammers? So for screwdrivers, I said the length and the diameter of the shank. Diameter um, tip type. So, what is the type here? You don't know. Hammers usually uh, specified based on their weight, right? Hammers are specified based on their weight. You should have learned this in your workshop technology module. Okay, so um, anyway. So the type of hammers used is a club hammer. It's more like a sledgehammer, but a smaller one. Uh, dead blow hammer, it's, uh, you know, what is a dead blow hammer, right? This dead blow hammer means it's actually have a steel. Uh, inside of the hammer is actually steel. 
but the uh, outside is actually rubber uh, not rubber actually something like a plastic and the rubber mallet cross spring hammer or cross spring hammer is used for uh, applications so some applications like this you can actually use cross plane hammer cross plane hammer <coughs> cross plane hammer uh, then mechanics hammer that uh, we usually use to fix metals and uh, again rubber mallet there's twice rubber mallet I had to remove that and uh, ball pin hammer ball pin hammer is the uh, usually the mechanics and uh, sheet metal works we use the ball pin hammer those are the usual uh, hammers we use in breakers because we don't need hammers that much so pry bar pry bar is actually some uh, a tool that we use to uh, split open two components or two pieces fixed together by pressing it or tightly pressed together so this actually comes with two different types there's the steel types and the plastic type usually the steel type is used for uh, exterior works such as uh, exterior and suspension works and the plastic type is for these plastic trim pieces which you can see under inside the vehicles like the dashboard uh, and the trim panels, the door boards, all these components and uh, even the shrouds. And uh, for example, one, uh, these can be used to remove the trim pieces in the radiator shroud. So these uh, are very useful components. So you have to actually decide for what purpose you have to use for exterior works, like underneath suspension works. Uh, these comes with like different lengths so different length means the higher the length of or the longer the pry bar, the less weight or less load you have to put. Uh, but uh, interior pry bars actually or interior trim removal kits also known as trim removal kits. So these are actually come with the plastic. So they are actually small components because how we adding more weight or more load into this could actually break them. Okay, next. <laughs> We have something called power tools. Uh, we have electric power tools, lightweight and cheap, available with different dryer size and pneumatic power tools. Heavy and need more attention because we need uh, continuous lubrication for these two, run continuously. Available with different sizes, highs and higher torque specs. These can actually do, uh, deliver incredibly high, uh, incredibly high uh, torque specifications. That's why uh, these are used for for heavy vehicle maintenance but uh, power tools electric power tools are now mostly can be used for any other applications so i have this question you have to actually do it uh, you have to consider you have to go through internet read find um, articles about these pneumatic and electric power tools so you have to compare the pneumatic and electric power tools on following aspects usability maintenance initial spend investment type of tools available. So for example, uh, initial investment. So in a pneumatic power tool, the initial investment is very high because uh, you had to buy a compressor, you had to have a complete uh, lubrication system and you have to have pneumatic lines, okay? But at the same time, usability is also quite a bit less because you always have to have a pneumatic power uh, or air force coming up but at the same time they can deliver a very high throw but uh, electric uh, ones if you see they need uh, constant charging and uh, they are not that much uh, durable so you have to consider these things or you have to compare these things uh, then you have to recommend for what are the solutions for what are the best suitable options for following applications for home garage medium scale automotive workshop and a large scale automotive workshop large scale so automotive workshop is something like a uh, what you call something like uh, mag uh, yeah something like yeah something like that or well, big automotive workshops and medium scale workshop is something 
very much similar to what we have in everywhere, small scale or medium scale workshops, which can maintain like five, six acres per day, right? So you have to decide based on the above comparison, you have to recommend which one is good for what, right? I need this question answer separately and you have to submit to me separately, right? So I will put a deadline for this uh, later and I will inform you. Okay, so special tools and equipment. So special tools and equipments, uh, we usually use for special purposes only. For example, pry bra and flat screwdriver, screwdriver. Both can be actually used to remove a bearing, right? Also a hammer can be used to bear, remove a bearing, but uh, it could be a difficult task as well as it could actually damage. But uh, there's a specific tool for that, which is known as a bearing puller. So that bearing puller can specifically do that without damaging it, right? That's specifically designed for that pur purpose. So that's what we're going to discuss here. So one specific tool is multimeter. Uh, you know why the multimeter is there. So the other one is test light. Test light is used to actually find out the power uh, or trace the wires. So multimeter is a good option, but uh, multimeter is not the easiest equipment to use. So we have the test light. Test light is mainly used for uh, tracing the wires. So you know the vehicles, they have like a lot of wires. If you have a problem in the wiring, you need to trace the wire up to from the problem area to let's say the brake light. So brake light is not working and you find out uh, it's not the brake light, it's something to do with the wire. So you have to trace the wire. In order to trace the wire, you need something like this. And uh, spark tester. Spark tester is specifically used for checking whether the spark plug is getting the electricity. So these can be fixed to, uh, these are fixed in between the spark plug and the lead. So each, uh, so that black color side goes to the spark plug and the, uh, this road disc goes into the uh, spark plug lead. So this will actually light if the spark plug is getting the power or it's easy, if it is getting high tension electricity, this will actually light showing that it's actually, uh, it's actually um, the current is coming up to the spark plug. So battery tester is, as it mentioned here, battery tester is used to test the batteries as you have used and DTC reader, also known as diagnostic trouble code reader, which you will be learning how to use specifically used to actually communicate with the uh, ECU of the vehicle and read the problem or what are the trouble codes. And stethoscope, uh, stethoscope is, oh, so this is actually a mechanics stethoscope. So sometimes the vehicle's uh, components actually making different noises and you are very if you are having a hard time finding where yeah, it's the problem or noise is coming from, a stethoscope code can be used to actually locate where this noise is actually coming from. This is somewhat different from the stethoscope code used by the doctors. Uh, and the bore scope is mainly used to see the components inside, especially the engine component, inside of the engine components. Uh, this is mainly designed to see the combustion chamber, how, what is the condition of the combustion chamber, but it can be used to see any components that are not possible to see. It's actually have a small camera and a display that you can put in two small holes. Pressure, fuel pressure gauge is uh, used to find and uh, these are used to uh, diagnose vehicles. So this particular component is used to check how much of fuel pressure is delivered uh, for electronic fuel injection vehicles especially. They need to have a specific fuel pressure. So in order to find how much of fuel should be, uh, should uh, over, how much of fuel is actually coming to the combustion, to the engine, this particular equipment can be used. And compression tester uh, is used again to diagnose the problem inside the engine, whether the engine is worn or something and use the compression tester. Timing light is specifically used to see the engine spark timing. So ignition timing can be checked using this. So there's uh, light is actually using a special phenomenon to show where the spark is sparking point of the uh, 
spark the point of ignition of the spark point uh, spark plugs filler gauge you know what is the purpose of the filler gauge bow gauge we usually used to uh, measure the uh, diameter of the bow and uh, how much of its square and what are the change that sort of details can be measured using the bow gauge piston compression ring whenever we are assembling a piston uh, the com piston rings has to be compressed in order to put them in right so we use a piston compression uh, piston ring compressor and clutch alignment rule uh, tool is a specific tool that uh, designed to align the clutch until the uh, pressure plate go over and bolt it so uh, in place and puller kit uh, puller this is only showing one puller but pullers are coming with a different set of pullers that are designed to pull a uh, component such as the damper pulley or bearing so different uh, applications can be uh, these can be used for different applications this these are not coming these are can be bought as simple single units or you can purchase these as uh, sets and coolant uh, system pressure tester is used to uh, find if there's any leaks in the coolant system strut compressor tool uh, this is a specific tool to use with the macpherson strut uh, compressor macpherson strut uh, <coughs> macpherson strut <coughs> these are specific tools to you be used with the macpherson strut uh, Macpherson strut as suspension assembly. So, in order to remove the suspension, uh, uh, like uh, coil spring out of this, uh, you need to compress the. Uh, in order to remove the strut, you need to compress it, compress the coil spring. So, this uh, particular tool is used for compression the uh, coil springs. Dial gauge, uh, dial gauge we usually use to. Uh, measure how much of slack and uh, what sort of a change between two places for example uh, differential there's something called a backlash backlash means how much of uh, play how much of play is in the uh, in the gear so if you have too much of play in the gear it will actually create a noise but if you have less amount of play that will actually create a uh, that will end up um, that will end up actually wearing your gear so in order to keep the gears and perfectly fit the uh, dial gauges has to be used again the puller and pressure again same thing so refractometer is actually used to measure the quality of the coolant brake fluid tester again used to uh, test how much of uh, water is present in the brake fluid and brake flow bleeder is used to feed the brake. So laser thermometer, as you know, it's used to measure the thermometer the temperature. This is uh, used in the vehicle application in order to find, uh, for example, these can be used to uh, find which, uh, uh, to find out how the combustion happening inside the how the spark is going on inside the combustion chamber. For example, if there's like four cylinders, uh, you can actually measure, if it is possible to measure the exhaust uh, temperature near to the um, exhaust uh, manifold temperature or exhaust runner temperatures of each uh, of the each runner of the manifold, you can actually find out whether all four cylinders are running perfectly because if it, it is all four cylinders temperature or exhaust temperature should be close by if one is actually having very low temperature that means that uh, particular uh, that particular cylinder may not be properly working caliper winding back you uh, is a tool used to actually uh, compress the caliper once the caliper is uh, removed you know the uh, caliper <clears throat> caliper piston cannot be uh, wind back without this tool it's difficult to wind it back so this tool is specifically built for that 
where in dry oak it is specifically built to uh, put the dry um, bearing you know press fit the bearing properly without losing the alignment vernier caliper as you know digital vernier calipers are used for measuring the length uh, special equipment is also available emission tester just to check the emission suspension testers are available to uh, these are actually expensive equipment uh, these used to check the quality of the suspension how much of the what, what is the frequency of the suspension and uh, this will actually generate a vibration uh, on the wheels and see how much of it is there and headlight adjuster uh, that's this is a specific uh, equipment used to adjust the headlights of a vehicle so advantage of using this is uh, the headlight adjusting even can be done without this machine but uh, you need a like 20 meters of distance between the headlight and where it's exactly reflecting from so by having this equipment that space can be reduced and even in daytime you can do the uh, headlight adjusting with this equipment so wheel balancer is used to balance the wheel uh, it's like while it's rotating it's added how much calculate how much weight has to be added in which place by doing so it will keep the wheel very well balanced so increasing the uh, it will increase the vehicle smoothness and it will in addition to that uh, uh, it will uh, um, it will uh, increase the lifetime or life of the bearing components because it won't generate much vibrations so wheel alignment machine you know why wheel alignment machines are there tire fitter is used to uh, uh, tire fitters are used to remove and assemble the tires and brake testing machines are there brake testing machines are there to check the brake distance and how the ABS systems operating uh, that's why the brake testing machines are there so this brake testing machine no brake testing is a mandatory task in some countries like UK and some countries the brakes has to be tested yearly and get approved before you are allowed to take the vehicle to the road so every year when you are playing the tax you have to go to a MOT process so a motor vehicle a motor has to be tested by a technician and you have to get a uh, you have to get the certified before you put the vehicle put it into the road or before you get the license to uh, right it's somewhat similar to our emission testing so next one is automotive rotisserie so this is uh, some very much similar to the chickens uh, chicken potatoes that used to rotate inside the oven the purpose of this uh, equipment is to rotate the whole vehicle uh, for painting work so air conditioner recovery machine is something that should be used in most uh, ac shops but uh, not available so as you know, air conditioning gas, so air conditioning uh, refrigerant is not something you should uh, leave to the environment because it's actually, it could actually, uh, it's actually damage our um, air quality. So because of that, air conditioning recovery machines are there, which actually take the uh, gas inside and they purify it before leaving it to the outside. Right, so this machine is a very important one if it is possible to purchase or use. Uh, next one is chassis dynamometer. Chassis dynamometer is used to tune and check the performance of the vehicle. So these are used to uh, increase and performance upgrades of the vehicle. And engine dynamometer is also same thing. Can be done the same thing, but in the engine dynamometer, the engine has to be completely removed from the uh vehicle and it has to be directly fit to the dynamometer but uh, just the dynamometer you can actually directly drive the vehicle over the dynamometer also known as a rolling road uh, then drive the vehicle on the chassis dynamometer for the measurements uh next one is corner balancing scale this is actually four scales that uh, connected to a center screen as shown here this all four wheels will be goes so all four uh, way scales will be going underneath each wheel so advantage of this is you can actually see how much of weight on each wheel 
So this uh, this is actually one uh, tool that used by uh, performance uh, oriented shops where you measure the weights and make sure all four wheels have certainly same amount of weight. So you know that vehicle should have like a more weight on the front and less weight on the rear. So something like a 45, 55 balance. So 45 on the rear, 55 on the front. So that will provide more grip on the front. So easily can be rotated. So this provide that balancing effect. So in order to do this balancing, suspension also should allow to be changed. So that, has, that means adjustable suspension should be available. Next one is dent puller, as it says. Uh, dents has to be pulled out once it has a small damages can be pulled out, the dent puller is there. Next one is, um, as you have, I think you might have heard about this and I have mostly seen this, this is a uh, paint booth. So it has a climate controlled inside and uh, all the spray, like the paint spray and everything is actually absorbed and cleaned before put it outside. So this is a very good and best way to work the vehicle. And next one is the hybrid electric vehicle, hybrid and electric vehicle toolkit. This is not a different tool. These are the same tools, but uh, they have a special um, cover around them. So uh, you will not be electrocuted because these are having like, usually these have like a uh, rated up to around thousand volts because these vehicles use high voltage system. Next one is the EV battery diagnostic equipment. So electronic or EV vehicles and hybrid vehicles have something called batteries. So in these batteries, it's not a single battery. If, even though we are calling about, we're talking about a battery, each battery is consisting another set of batteries, also known as cells. So all these cells has to be matching with each other, right? So that's actually known as uh, battery balancing. So in order to do these battery balancing, whenever you are changing the battery cells, it has to be, so battery has to be balanced, right? So this balancing, to do this balancing thing, you need a equipment like this, also known as a battery balancing equipment. So next we have a valve spring compressor. Uh, you know why valve spring compressor is there. And, uh, there are two important things. The next one is actually the workshop manuals. It's very important to have the workshop manuals because uh, without the workshop manuals, you are actually working blind. So uh, type, how much uh, type you have to put, what are the wiring, which wiring goes where. So these details you have to get from uh, these manuals. Also, you can do it by yourself and you can explore and find out, but uh, using manuals are easier. Nowadays, manuals, you don't have to buy it. You can actually pay a subscription fee for, there are a lot of websites available. You can pay a subscription fee and get your workshop manuals. Read and work with the workshop manuals here. Yeah. And last, we have automotive oscilloscope. So usual oscilloscope and automotive oscilloscope is different. So automotive oscilloscope is actually consists of all these components shown here. Uh, it's actually not a usual oscilloscope, means it's actually turning a laptop into an oscilloscope. So there's like a control module that uh, directly connects to our computer to the USB. And that software, there's a software package turn it into a, uh, like an oscilloscope. The advantage is this, these are specifically tuned to used with the vehicle. Uh, uh, used to uh, tune with the uh, work with the vehicle sensors and actuators, right? Sensors and actuators, and uh, they have like a rugged, uh, uh, or oh, how do I say, heavy uh, cover around it, so nothing will happen even if you kept it inside the engine bay while the engine is running. So, those are the tools that we can use, and uh, if there's any tool. Mr. Actually, here you can let me know. Yeah, so now we come to the question again. As I told you earlier, the equipment used here in the 
uh, equipment used or oh, equipment made uh, sorry equipments uh, used in assembly plant is different from a usual workshop what is the reason for what what does the difference between these two anyone Answer. What's the difference between a uh, usual workshop tools or the workshop tools that we use and the workshop tools used by uh, assembly plant? Okay, so since no one is answering, let me answer. Is everybody sleeping or something? So, in a assembly plant, right, they are only working with the same model, right? Same specific model, same tools, same bolts, same nuts. So they don't have to have like a lot of tools. They need to have a set of specific tools just to do the job. So for one station, they will only have like few equipment. So few tools, that's it, nothing else. But in a workshop, since you are working with different bakers with different issues and different uh, applications, you need to have a lot of tools. So you have a lot of tools, a lot of equipments in it. Uh, assembly plant, they are doing a specific jobs at specific stations. So you just need to have those at that place only that's it nothing else so the difference between these two is assembly plant is completely worried about the efficiency of that so so they will only consider about the efficiency so they will do whatever to make sure the efficiency is there so they will not even put extra tools because extra or additional tools in case if you take the wrong tool then you have to put it back and take the correct tool so to avoid that, only the necessary tools will be available for the stations. So that's the difference between the workshop and a normal, a normal workshop and a assembly plan. Okay. Now you have an assignment. So your assignment is to purchase tools and equipment for following two workshops. There are two workshops provided here. Uh, one extra workshop is the home garage, other one is the medium scale automotive repair center, right? So automotive repair center means it's not a service center, it's a repair center. So it's a running repair center, so no paint works or anything like that. So explain the factors you will be considering when you are selecting the tools and equipment for these two workshops, right? Then list down the tools and equipment you will purchase for each of the above workshop. So that's the work. So you can read anywhere, you can um, go through this and find more details about it and come up with two lists. What are the equipments you need for these uh, two workshops? So here you have to consider one thing, what are the vehicles you will be maintaining? For home garage, you will be maintaining a same vehicle. It's like only the vehicles you have, right? And if you have a medium scale workshop, you have a lot of vehicle types, so you have to consider about these things. So due date is 8th of June 2021 at 4 p.m. You have to submit it to, uh, to a LMS, already the LMS, uh, I have prepared the upload. So you have the link there. Uh, you can actually upload there. When you are uploading the scripts, so only uh, it will only take PDF files. So you have to submit that as a PDF file. And the 
sample name is given here. So you have to name your file as follows. So 2018 slash ET slash your number or your registration number underscore a double s zero one Simon zero one right this is how you actually name your uh, assignment file don't put anything else it's very hard to find the assignments after you put different names so you always have to use this format for and uh, naming your uh, files okay so your answer script has to be named using this uh, format. So yeah, that's it. If you don't have any questions, I will be stopping here. Yes, go ahead. Uh, uh, some uh, can't actually hear uh, uh, you. Login the Adlib message. Uh, so we, uh, can okay. So yes, I got the question. If you can't log in the LMS, you can still use my email. I gave you my email. So send me that email. Okay, so if you don't have the LMS, if you have any problems with the LMS, you can send it to my email address. But when you are sending the email address also, you have to send it as PDF file and you have to send it uh, with the same name sample, so name <laughs> format. Don't use anything else. Anything else? Any question? Any other questions? Okay, seems like uh there are no other questions so that's it then so it's two hours and 15 minutes that's fine so if you don't have anything so i will be i'll be finishing the lecture from here if you have anything else you can actually reach to me through email or you can speak me to uh, lms Okay, thank you. Good night. Good night, sir. Thank you.